Good afternoon. Welcome to Common Sense Institute's 2021 Ballot Guide, where we're going to be reviewing key issues on the state and local fall mail ballot. And um, I am Dan Yegamir. I'm the editorial page editor of the Denver Gazette. We are co-sponsoring this event. Um, I've been asked to just wait a few more minutes to allow some more people to join our gathering here, and then we'll get started. Welcome again, everyone. I'm Dan Yegamir with the Denver Gazette. Um, I'm the editorial page editor over there, and I'm pleased to join the Common Sense Institute's 2021 ballot guide to some key state and local ballot issues. Um, pleased to have you all with us. And I'm going to hand the mic to Chris Brown. He is the vice president over at the Common Sense Institute. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, pleasure to be here and have this conversation. It is ballot season again. And uh, here at the Common Sense Institute, we put out uh, our research and analysis on several of the statewide issues and a few of the Denver issues that we published on our website. You can download and access both our guide and the full report at Common Sense Institute CO. Dot org. And for those of you that have already read it, I look forward to some tough questions. But for the time we have here, I wanted to run through some summary remarks, summary findings on these issues, give you a little bit of exposure to the, the, uh, the ballot measures themselves and some of the considerations from an economic and fiscal standpoint. And Dan, I very much look forward to your questions and, and dialogue as as well. So while this year may seem a little bit thinner from the standpoint of the number of issues on the statewide uh, level, uh, these issues are still comprehensive and quite impactful from a taxpayer and uh, citizen standpoint. So I think, you know, in years past, you may have had to study up on maybe close to a dozen. We're not there this year. There's only three. We have one constitutional amendment on the ballot and two statutory changes being proposed. So, uh, but again, nonetheless, a lot here to unpack and we'll try to do that over the next few minutes. Uh, in the ballot guide and uh, in our analysis, we explicitly looked at Proposition 119 and 120, the two statutory proposals. Amendment 78 is the constitutional change would require 55% of the vote to pass. And it is related to custodial funds. 
We specifically did not analyze that issue as part of our guide. I'd be happy to take some questions on that issue and offer a few remarks here. But again, an important issue that I think really became more relevant and became an important topic over the last 18 months as the state uh, really took on an unprecedented amount of federal funds uh, due to federal authorizations related to the pandemic. And the question before voters is whether or not custodial funds or non-state uh, revenue, but money that becomes available to the state to spend either from federal revenue or as we saw last year, or early, earlier this year, significant uh, settlements that the state receives from, from lawsuits. Uh, money that is outside of state revenue currently is at the discretion of the agency that that money is allocated to and does not go through the same budgeting process. And so the question would, uh, before voters, is whether or not that uh, those custodial funds should be allocated and at the discretion of the legislature in the same way state tax revenue is. And again, maybe we can dive into that if you have some questions on that later, Dan. But the other two issues I'd like to get into are Proposition 119 and 120. So the first one here, Proposition 119, is the Learning Enrichment and Academic Progress Program. Uh, it is a measure which would be funded through two sources of revenue, a 5% uh, increase on the tax on recreational marijuana at the statewide level, raising it from 15 to 20% statewide, and has a diversion of land trust uh, revenue that the state uh, is currently spending elsewhere in the form of about $22 million long-term that would those two sources would combine to provide this program with, at its full implementation, uh, around $140 million in funds to provide to eligible students in the K-12 system, prioritizing low-income students for the purpose of obtaining out-of-school learning uh, opportunities, learning enrichment, outside the classroom in the form of tutoring, mentoring, uh, learning support, um, counseling. And so this, this is coming at a time uh, where students are you know, recovering from the pandemic and learning loss, but this is also an issue that's been in, in the books and been debated for, for some time now. We looked specifically at the question of the reach of this program, how many students could this actually reach. And uh, it's quite significant. The amount of funds on an individual student basis is capped at $1,500. Uh, and so given average prices for these services, students could receive about two and a half hours a week of tutoring over the course of the 32-week school year. Um, and if, if you, know, you looked at the number of students that would, if say on average, use the full $1,500 benefit, it would reach uh, more than uh, 94,000 students, which would cover all students at or below 150% of the federal poverty level, the, the demographic that this measure is really trying to prioritize. So an interesting measure with, with sort of unique revenue source uh, issues, and, and there's some trade-offs there undoubtedly, but has the potential to reach a significant number of students uh, for the purpose of, again, obtaining these out-of-school learning uh, opportunity. So maybe a lot to unpack there, Dan, and I'd, I'd be curious what questions or remarks you have on this issue. One that comes to mind right away is this. Um, what would be the, the uh, labor pool, if you will, or the talent pool from which uh, to which this money will be applied? Who are the kinds of providers? What kinds of Coloradans are actually or elsewhere? And what kinds of resources, whether it's, it's, it's human resources or it's just online stuff? Um, are available to apply this to? And, and who would be provided for the tutoring, which I'm pre presuming is gonna be a big part of this, a significant part of this, um, who's going to be those tutors? Where will, where will the kids find and their parents find these uh, resources? And what do they look like? It's a great question. So I think practically uh, those entities and individuals that want to be part of this program will have to initially be 
certified or okayed in some way through the LEAP program. So there's a process to be um, you know, authorized to receive these funds. Uh, so they will have to you know, go through that and, and, and gain that approval. And I, my understanding is they wanna cast that net as wide as possible. But to your question, there exists a lot of organizations that provide say um, uh, technology assistance for, for students. Uh, or uh, out of school um, opportunities to get involved in, in specific programs and sciences. So there are some networks of existing nonprofits, but I think a big part of the labor pool, specifically as it relates to tutoring, probably will be educators themselves, teachers themselves. Public school so, teachers who are currently certified public school teachers and teaching our kids in class right now. Exactly right. Exactly right. That's my understanding. Again, and we will see, but but this is a, certainly an opportunity for, for teachers to, to engage with students outside the classroom uh, and, and for students to have that extra support. So it it's, seems very likely that could be a large part of this program. Let me, let me pursue that just with one more question. And, and, and in the interest of disclosure, the, the Gazette, the Denver Gazette and, and the Gazettes in general have come out in, in, in favor of Proposition 119. We have endorsed it. Um, so, you know, consider the source of this question. But that said, um, I, I am aware of, of some concerns that have been raised about whether there would be resources available. And if there are, and particularly in terms of human resources for, for tutoring, um, would they be qualified? But it, it just seems to me to be um, a, a significant, arguably, win-win if indeed, um, one, the, the tutors that the kids are getting are certified public school teachers, duly certified by the Colorado State Department of Education, and for the teachers themselves, because this is supplemental income, and this is these are services that they can offer, and teachers are often tutoring kids anyway, at least they would finally be compensated for it. Um, yeah, well, you know, it, it's not explicit in the measure, but I would hope that a big part of this, you know, should it pass, would be some oversight into the outcomes and effectiveness of the programs and, and organizations and individuals that are providing these services. So, you know, that accountability, that transparency, uh, I, I would hope would be a big part of uh, the reporting out on this program. So taxpayers, parents could understand where those services are that are really having a more positive impact and, and substantive in helping students, you know, achieve uh, what they're what they're after. So, uh, yeah, I think that will have to be a big part of this. There is a, a governance structure that this would set up that would have to set up some of those administrative questions. But um, uh, I, I agree with you. It, it would be very important to, to ensure that these that these funds and the outcomes for these students are are uh, really being beneficial. And 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 this is a net positive in terms of an impact for students and taxpayer dollars. Now, again, written into the, the proposal, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it will folk, it will prioritize low income slash at risk kids, right? Exactly right. So exactly right. Arguably, were some of the biggest deficits coming out of the pandemic and basically what many parents have regarded as a, and, you know, I'm a DPS parent myself, have regarded as a year off of school, unfortunately, or some are calling it a lost year. Um, the, these big deficits coming out of there, arguably the, the biggest of those big deficits were in, in kids in at-risk and, and, and low-income homes where there's simply less uh, digital access and the proverbial digital divide comes into play. If you want to address any of that. I'd, uh... Yeah, I think, I think for certainly some students through this pandemic have, have had access to these sort of services and, and parents had time or funds to, to do that. Uh, I don't have a specific sense of, of how those test scores changed explicitly when we look at the, the, that income breakout, but overall we saw a, a, a 6% increase or, or an additional 6% of students underperformed uh, in their uh, math test scores for those grades that were tested this year was a little spotty and actually the, 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 the classes and grades that were tested. But you know, if you, if you equate that across the entire K-12 system, and let's say that's the learning loss that we're seeing, uh, you know, that's impacting 55,000 students that are now underperforming that in years past would have been at a level of proficiency in these tests. And so 
you know, while th there are long-term issues that we've researched and others have researched around the state's graduation rates and test scores, you know, I think there is an acute issue in the, at this moment that certainly was harder felt by uh, families that didn't have the resources for these sorts of services over the last 18 months to begin with. I have a question about funding, if I may, if I'm not taking too much time on this particular. No, element. please. Um, you know, the 20% the tax on marijuana, um, uh, well, actually, this would correct me if I'm wrong. Is that the current? Oh, I'm looking at the uh, slide here, by the way, and it's 20% taxes. Is that what's currently the total tax, or was that what it would be with this added in? That's where it would be with this added in. Okay. And this is five. Only 15%. That's right. Oh, this is 15%, right? This is 15% flat. Uh, uh, oh, it's, uh, okay. So, um, one of the things we're hearing, obviously, no industry begs to be taxed because they're worried about, even though they pass that through, they're worried about inevitably, no matter what the good or service is, they're worried about the effect on sales. Um, in this case, we're hearing some marijuana vendors and mostly industry representatives raise the fear that they might be driven back underground. So they say, oh, ironic, you know, here we were legalized in 2012 by a, a statewide vote, and now we're going to be criminalized again effectively by being driven into the black market. What realistically, is, to the best of your knowledge or your knowledge of, 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 of data that's been collected, say, on, on tobacco or on other industries or on marijuana that have been taxed, what realistically is the likelihood that, that this is going to in any in any appreciable way, contribute to black market sales of of marijuana in Colorado um, versus people simply accepting the tax and saying this is part of the price of using marijuana. It's it's a it's a fair, very fair question. It's not something we looked at explicitly, uh, and so it's hard to say if this measure alone and this five percent how much that would contribute directly, but. I think you're, you, you do raise a much a bigger question about the extent to which you, you raise the cost of legal marijuana and you, you, and, and you undoubtedly will see people moving to, to the buy it illegally. At what point that happens exactly, I couldn't say, but you also have to keep in mind that this would be a 20% statewide tax. You know, this, local jurisdictions are adding on 10, you know, city of Denver just approved an increase again last year, I believe. So, you know, and has another one on the ballot this year. There's another one, right? Funding various things uh, at the ballot this year, exactly. So you're, you're potentially raising the overall tax 30, 35, 40%, maybe, right? And, and that will undoubtedly change behavior. So I think it's a real concern and, and you can't, you know, when the statewide tax rate on sales tax is 2.9%, uh, it's it's of course going to change behavior at some point, and it can't it can't sustain funding everything, right? Uh, all these programs, so it's it's a real concern and a real uh, challenge. But I don't have a clear answer for you on exactly how much I would think um, this would impact your specific question. So, do you mind if we let's move on to Proposition One Twenty and the property tax uh, assessment rate drop. And, you know, if, if you know, we had a good discussion on LEAP, uh, this one will be quite a tongue twister. So let's, let's I hope um, we can do this one justice and help voters understand the, the complexity here. So this measure, as it was initially written, as it was approved when it received its title earlier this year, as it was approved by the Supreme Court after a challenge, um, was altered or potentially altered by state legislation that was introduced following the approval and uh, as this measure was getting its uh, signatures collected to be on the ballot. So I just use that as a backdrop to understand the scenarios and the, the differing outcomes and why we talk about uncertainty around what the real impact of this measure will be. So as originally proposed, Proposition 120 would have lowered our uh, state assessment rates on commercial property and residential property as part of the property tax formula. So it would, it would, it would have lowered by 8% the, the portion of our 
a property that the mill levies or the tax rates ultimately get applied to, lowering the tax burden by about 8%, assuming mill levies didn't, didn't go up. And that's a big assumption there. But, um, and the estimate for how much that would impact revenue over the next year was about a little over a billion dollars in an impact on local revenue through reducing the, those assessment rates. And there's a lot of questions about how, you know, uh, that's a billion dollar against the projection. And we're seeing properties increase significantly, which will impact collections in, in following years after the next assessment cycle, given we've just went through one um, that accounted for some of that property, that price growth, but not through, you know, through the, the current year. But undoubtedly, we're seeing rapid increases in property values. Some, some jurisdictions have said up of 10, 15% overall. So an 8% drop may still be, uh, you'll still see overall revenue increase for some jurisdictions. However, against the projections, it was about a billion dollar reduction. Inter Senate Bill 293, which again passed after the Supreme Court approved this measure for the ballot, and it changed the definitions of property classes so that the assessment rates will only apply to, the changes will only apply to uh, lodging in the commercial property and multifamily in the residential side. So single family homeowners voting on this, reading the language of the text that says, uh, shall we drop assessment rates for residential property? If Senate Bill 293 holds, then uh, they will not see a change in their assessment rate, despite that being the text of the measure, as long as that, that uh, Senate bill is, is upheld and there will be some litigation and court proceedings that, that go on certainly from this. But I sort of just put that out there because um, there, there are some uncertain outcomes and challenges because of the, the uh, connection between Senate bill 293 and this proposition. Chris, what's the impact of the cuts, though, on, on people who uh, in some way are connected to the properties, the, the two that you mentioned, that is to say, uh, multifamily in the residential category and lodging, hotels, motels, B&Bs, and so forth in the commercial category. What, what impact will that nonetheless have? And what, uh, what is the potential for uh, a ripple effect in terms of just cutting taxes to those properties alone? Yeah, so you know, over the last 20, 30 years, as we had the Gallagher Amendment, you know, commercial property tax rates did not change. Residential would fall and commercial would stay the same. So there is an implication that a lot of these properties have seen taxes and their tax amount go up significantly as, it's, as their tax bill has risen with their value. So that, that provides undoubtedly some relief to, to the multifamily, uh, that's apartments and and. Uh, lodge, uh, lodging or, or hotels. So there is some relief that the aggregate impact is approximately 100 to $150 million uh, in, in statewide revenue implicate, uh, impact from, the, um, uh, from just isolating those properties alone. So there certainly is some relief, but in terms of overall impacts, it's significantly muted from where the measure started. Right. But that said, you know, if you stay in a hotel room or if you, I mean, it, it, right now, you know, your property tax, along with all the other costs of doing business as a hotel are built into your, into your room rate. Um, if you rent an apartment, um, property tax, along with various other uh, overhead of the landlord built into your rent. And so it, that, that's the connection I'm kind of thinking of and the potential for it creating tax relief in that regard as well. Yeah, certainly. You know, if, 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 these property owners are facing prop uh, tax bills going up 15, 20%. A lot of that will get passed on through higher rents, higher rates, and some relief would mean they wouldn't have to raise rates to the same extent, likely. Again, every you know sort of entity will play out a little bit differently, but without a doubt, that dynamic is at play. And and I think um, still to your point, still a very impactful for those types of properties and and consumers in those markets uh, going forward. Um, if the full, there is talk of litigation, should this measure pass, that would uh, seek 
to reinstate the original reading, basically to abrogate the legislation that was passed. And it's, as I understand it, and as we, as we have noted in our editorial voice in support of this measure as well, we also endorse this measure. Um, as we've noted, it's a, it's a, it stands to be a fairly serious legal effort should the measure pass. It's not just going to be um, sort of a, a, a trial balloon. Um, were that to happen, what would be the overall fiscal impact on the state? And not in dollars and cents, but in terms of the budget. I mean, there's a reason the legislature, I'll use our verbiage, not yours, I'm not putting words in your mouth, sabotaged uh, this ballot issue in advance. Um, they had a different set of priorities and they didn't want to see the state budget affected by this. What is your perspective on what the impact would be on the state budget? Yeah, well, so, you know, property tax revenue goes specifically to local governments. However, because local governments fund education, their, if, if their revenue does decline or their commitment on that formula is not kept up, there, there may be some, or there would be commitments from the state to backfill some of those funds, the extent we, cite, we see significant revenue decline. Um, I don't have a firm sense of the the general fund exposure here in 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 the long term. Again, I think it will really depend on where we see those valuations and the extent to which that billion dollar reduction is is what it means year over year, really, because it is it's against a, a pretty significant growth projection. We used a very conservative estimate for our growth estimate, um, looking just at historical averages, which I think probably underestimates the, the baseline for where revenue will be. So it's hard to say exactly, but, um, but definitely, you know, that, that is an issue. Uh, I think the state legislature was considering in theirs as long with, with, you know, simply the impact to local governments. In well, let's country. elaborate on that. The impact to local governments, is it a sky is falling thing? Is there going to be some serious repercussions if this were to pass and be reinstated to its full strength as originally uh, drafted and proposed to voters? Is it going to be, uh, or is it is is there an overstatement of the impact it might have on the typical, let's say, school district um, budget among within color among Colorado's 178 school districts? So, uh, I, I think there's one real complication in this tax code that we have here in Colorado around property taxes. We have a statewide assessment, so every jurisdiction will will see this eight percent drop. In some jurisdictions that have seen property values increase more quickly, they won't feel the impact that significantly. Um, and but some may, in particularly rural districts or districts that haven't seen their property tax go up quite as much. But I, I think an important layer on top of this, which you know we included in our full analysis, is the extent to which revenues have rebounded for sales tax, property tax, and, and on top of it, local governments and the state government as well has received you know, billions, I mean, millions at the local level, billions at the state level in federal funds that are, are really struggling in many ways to go out the door. And, and so there, when you look at the overall funding picture of these jurisdictions, it's, it's hard to say exactly, but um, I don't think that there will be nearly as much strain as, as might be suggested. And again, I think the, the federal funds is an important piece that will be available over the next three to four years. And then the flip side of that, of course, is the benefit to the taxpayers should the amendment or the proposition pass and should litigation ultimately result in the reinstatement of its original impact as intended. Um, so, you know, the, 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 tax relief from the standpoint of the typical, let's say Denver homeowner can't come too soon considering how they've been soaring given the, as you pointed out at the outset, the, my words, soaring property values and what that's doing, um, albeit in delayed effect to, to uh, property tax bills. I mean, you know, there are long time homeowners, right? Who are saying, yeah, that's great for people who are buying and selling. I just want to live in my house without being priced out of it by my property, property tax bill. The impact so, could be significant for them, yes? Yeah, abs I mean, absolutely. And I think you know, that, that's really the intent, I think, here of, of the measure. Um, 
And, and undoubtedly, I mean, seeing your tax bill go up 10, 15%, because we, again, we're no longer governed by the Gallagher Amendment, so we don't have any formula that reduces or, or reduces our tax burden or uh, maintains it. You, you point out a demographic and a, and a homeowner that could be very strained by that you know, significant increase. That's outpacing your income. That's outpacing your ability to pay. And, and I think that's an important piece and, and uh, for, for considering you know, the measure as originally intended. Well, and you in bringing up the Gallagher Amendment, as you just did just now and a few minutes ago, I, uh, for my money, you, you touched on a, a really fundamental um, factor in the equation here. And, and I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on this is um, the extent to which homeowners, most of whom do not walk, have a walking around knowledge of, of the complexities of property taxation. They know what their property tax bill is. They get the basics of mills. They get whether or not they support a local property tax hike for typically for a bond issue for a school or something like that. But the impact it's going to have on them when they are now um, no longer shielded by Gallagher. If you could elaborate on that a little more. I just think that's, from my perspective, that's instrumental. That's going to have a, this going to make a big difference because in a sense, homeowners have been estranged from um, some of the outermost effects of rising property values affecting their property taxes because the overall property tax base on the residential side was kept in check by Gallagher. That's gone. And this is going to be the first go round where people are, are, are starting to wonder what the heck happened. So, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, we, we featured some of these considerations and challenges when in our analysis on uh, Proposition CC, uh, when voters voted to essentially freeze and, and get rid of that formula that did govern property tax. So as you said it perfectly, homeowners, property owners, uh, specifically residential homeowners are now exp really beholden, their tax bill is beholden to the growth and value of their homes, uh, as opposed to seeing any relief. And, you know, that that's not something homeowners have seen in years past. So this is new dynamic. And, you know, I think a bigger point as well is that this measure, even should it pass, probably won't be the end of the property tax debate and uh, reform discussion uh, going forward, because we'll still be, it just drops the, the rate and leaves it there. There's still a lot of issues on the commercial side and the overall formula. So, you know, I, I, it's something I think voters need to, you know, continue to educate themselves on and become familiar with, because I don't think this will uh, be the end of it. So let's, uh, if, if we move on to two more issues, and I'll try to run through these quickly, for those in Denver, there are a couple measures, there's actually a host of measures on the local level. We've, we talked about two specifically, and I'll just give you a little bit of insight and turn you to our ballot guide, sort of in the interest of time. But uh, we've done quite a bit of work around the finances and economic impacts of expenditures related to homelessness in Denver and the Denver Metro. So we looked at Ordinance 303, or termed Let's Do Better, and Bond Question 2B, uh, part of the mayor's bonding package, both of which are directly related to uh, individuals experiencing homelessness. Uh, Ordinance 303, or Let's Do Better, uh, is a measure which would um, allow private citizens to report individuals currently uh, violating the current camping ban and if the, if the city did not enforce the campaign within 36 hours, I believe, it could be 24, 36 hours, then the we, citizens could bring civil suit against the city. Uh, it also uh, allows the city to create up to four designated camping sites or, or urban camping areas uh, with the requirement to have sanitary conditions, running water, and facilities at those sites. Uh, bond question 2B is a, a $37 million bond question for the purchase of emergency shelter and um, new housing units for those experiencing homelessness. Um, we featured it because while those two measures don't increase ta taxes explicitly, it would increase the overall expenditure on those experiencing homelessness over 
half a billion dollars by 2022. Um, our estimate, as you can see from just two years ago, was 434 million. And that put the range of uh, expenditure on, on individuals experiencing homelessness of between $40,000 and $105,000 per individual. So uh, an important issue from, an ex from, a, from a taxpayer standpoint and from sort of uh, you know, um, understanding what's going on with this issue overall. So let me cycle to the next one, Ordinance 304. This is, was termed uh, enough taxes already. And this, if you're a voter in city of Denver, uh, again, as well, you've uh, been part of and seen significant tax increases voter approved over the last three, four years, where the uh, overall city sales tax has gone from 3.65% to now 4.81% really all in. This measure would cap the city sales tax at 4.5% which is a reduction of about 6.4% against the projection and leave it there in perpetuity. If voters want to approve new sales tax in the future, then city council or voters would have to change the other tax rates to remain under that 4.5% cap. Um, so a, a sales tax measure sort of in response to recent sales tax increases, but uh, nonetheless, a question that voters will see here in, in already on their ballot and in the next uh, next week when they go and vote. So I wanted to make sure to feature those two and I'll take questions or your thoughts on those, but just wanted to cycle through both at the same time. Chris, I have a question about uh, structurally how the one would work on, on 304 and specifically the leveling that the city would have to do, city and county of Denver under uh, its, within its rubrics to stay at or below the 4.5% sales tax aggregate maximum. If, this, if voters in a subsequent election, and, and this part of it is addressed, um, decide to pass a, a, a half a cent sales tax for whatever, the zoo, well, it's covered by, it gets its own tax already, but you know, let's say for the zoo, let's just say that. And um, that would be by definition earmarked. So that much revenue that is derived from that has to go to the zoo area. Does that mean that the city would have to basically reduce its take in terms of general fund uh, revenue that comes from the aggregate sales tax? Because it can't even, even it has to lower the overall threshold, or I mean, it has to keep it at 4.5% under this proposal. But it, to my understanding, uh, a new sales tax that's passed, which would be allowed, would be earmarked. And so the funding for that would have to go in toto to what it says. Yeah, my understanding would be city council would have to either change that base sales tax rate that, that, that goes to the general fund or some combination of the base tax rate along with any of the incremental sales tax increases that were passed by voters. Now, as I, as I believe those are all statutory, they could change, uh, but again, those were approved by voters in years past. And so those are going to dedicated things as well. So it, 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 it is an open-ended question, exactly how city council would address that. And I think it would certainly pr present some challenges there. So your question is spot on, but I don't have a definitive answer, but I think all of the above would be on the table in terms of how they could maneuver both the base tax rate and the incremental ones. Uh, Chris, we endorsed this one as well. Um, we pointed out that the $80 million that would be reduced up front by capping it um, or by cutting it and, and then capping it uh, may or may not seem like a lot of money in terms of the overall revenue pick or in terms of the priorities of the city council, but is part would be a reduction out of a $1.49 billion Denver budget. Looked at in that light, uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on in terms of the impact on the overall budget. Is it going to be that pronounced? Is, it, uh, is there wiggle room 
uh, you know, as a political matter, I think we know at the Gazette where we, what we think that this say on the Gazette's editorial board what we think about this, but purely budgetarily, is there wiggle room within the state, within the uh, city and county of Denver's budget to accommodate that? Well, you know, I, I guess one point, two points. One is this would return the sales tax rate, as you can see in this chart here, to a level that is still above where it was in 2020. So overall, the, the tax rate would still be above the 2020 tax rate. It, so it comes down from the 2021 level and where it would be projected to be. Um, that said, uh, you know, no, I don't know any government that is, is not proficient in budgeting against the money they expect to come in. So you know, what they, they will have budgeted, anticipated to spend it uh, without a doubt. However, um, you know, the, the, the money has grown over the last several years as a result of these rates increasing. So, um, and I go back to where, what we discussed in the property tax, the same issue in the property tax debate where, especially Denver is the largest city here in the state has received hundreds of millions in federal funds that is being spent across various services and, and items. And so uh, it's, it's, it's not, the city has claimed that this, yes, against the current budget, they'll have to make some reductions because it's already been budgeted. However, you know, again, you have to kind of consider where tax revenue has been over the last several years. You know, Denver residents are paying, as we show here, on an inflation adjusted per resident basis, 25% more than they were less than a decade ago in 2014. So that's total tax burden of the average Denver. That's right. That's right. So that's a quarter percent more on average, that's not, that's not just because of inflation, that's you know, in real dollars. So it's, it's, the tax burden has gone up. The, the expenditures and, and, and revenue to the city has gone up from its local citizens. And I think this measure is, as you can see, rolling that back to some extent. Um, and and you know, local government, city government will have to adjust. Well, Chris, say that one more time, if you would, before we let this go, that, that the point you made a moment ago about how this still, even if the, 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 this, this tax cut and cap passes, it's still going to be higher than when? Re re repeat that. Part. Well, I think one estimate you can, you can pin down would be the revenue, projected revenue in 2022 would still be 12.1% higher than it was in 2019. So revenue would still have gone up uh, by over 12%. Um, but just not as much as it would be projected to be. So, you know, some nuance there undoubtedly, but, uh, but, but because these, the tax rate has continued to go up with these voter approved measures, um, you know, this kind of rolls back uh, the rate slightly to where again, above where it was in 2020. Well, from our editorial perspective, that kind of mutes the doomsday scenarios. Certainly. Um, well, I, I'd like to, you know, maybe if you have any other questions or pass it over to anyone in the audience, I don't know if you are um, seeing those questions that we're receiving or, or being able to funnel those over, but I'd, I'd like to, you know, offer some summary remarks or take any other questions you have. We covered everything, it looks like, Dan. That's great. Okay. Great. Um, well, um, I, again, hold on another opportunity for anyone to ask any questions, but uh, um, uh, obviously we want to thank everyone for joining in on this, and we hope it's been enlightening. Uh, again, my role in this has been sort of like as the, the uh, inquisitor, but uh, I, I do uh, respect the uh, Common Sense Institute's role here as a provider of information and a, and a, a research institution that has helped enlighten us on just some of the basic facts and figures and the functionality of these proposals. Um, Chris, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts on any of the ballot issues. Well, I, I, I you know, would 
like to explicitly say thank you very much to you and, and to the Gazette for, for featuring this conversation and, and having this dialogue. I think, you know, voters that want to dig into these issues, it's a great service to, to have, you know, some exposure and, and dialogue and, and, and hear some of this in-depth discussion. So thank you to you for, for partnering and, and, and participating in this. And, um, and good luck to, to Colorado voters in, in continuing the education and, and uh, being prepared for election day next week.